Hi folks, Mr. Ackerman here. Thanks for watching. The topic of today's video is conservation of momentum, which I know you already know about, law of conservation of momentum, but this time we're going to apply it in two-dimensional collisions. So since you already know the law, and since you already know about how to deal with two-dimensional motion, uh, of course that would be using the idea of vector components, therefore this should be a fairly short video. So let's take a look at some of the questions that will be answered. They are up here. Take a look also at where we are in the unit schedule. This is the last official lesson in this unit before the test. And also take a look at the learning goals and success criteria. Pause the video to do that for a moment. Okay, and you're back. And now we're going to dive right into things with a look at a question in the textbook. This is in the uh, Physics 12 textbook by Nelson. Sample problem 2 in section 5.4. Let's have a look. In a game of marbles, a collision occurs between two marbles of equal mass m. One of the marbles is initially at rest, and after the collision, it acquires a velocity of 1.1 meters per second at an angle of 40 degrees from the original direction of motion of the other marble, which has a speed of 1.36 meters per second after the collision. That's a mouthful, that sentence. Let's have a look at what it looks like. Before the collision, you're dealing with the following situation. You have the first marble, mass m, the red one, inbound at some unknown velocity v1. It strikes the blue marble, also mass m, that is initially at rest, so v2 equal to zero. Afterwards, the originally stationary marble is moving at an angle of 40 degrees to the original direction of motion of the other marble, that would be the positive x direction, makes a 40 degree angle, and the newly acquired speed is 1.1 meters per second, so that's a v prime. The velocity of the originally inbound or originally moving marble is 1.36, but we don't know its angle. In fact, you might be wondering, how do I know whether it's moving at an angle to the x-axis or not? Well, in order to see why this is in fact a reasonable depiction of the after image, I'd like you to go to our friends at FET. So we're going to hop over there where they have, under the physics and motion section, a collision lab. And this is really cool. So if you've never played billiards before, and you're not really used to two-dimensional collisions, this is a great place to start. Download this, and here's what it looks like. When you reset everything, you have these two spherical or circular looking objects with their velocity vectors given. So you have a number of options along the side here where you can view various different vectors or not. It's up to you. The ones that you really want are the reflecting border, which are, if we were on a pool table, these are the bumpers along the side, and the velocity vectors. The mass is set at the bottom here, and to mimic the problem, that we are dealing with from the textbook, I'm going to make them both equal mass, so that mass is not really a factor. Uh, they also said that one of the balls is inbound like this, so I'm going to make this velocity vector as horizontal as I can. I'm going to move this ball just a little offset so that we get that sort of glancing collision, as it's called, and I'm going to put the velocity vector in the middle here so that this ball is not moving prior to the collision. Maybe I'll just move it over a tiny bit like that. All right, and at this point, you can uh, speed up or slow down the simulation. It's up to you. Maybe we'll slow it down a bit so we can watch and uh, gather our thoughts as things are happening. So let's see whether this image over here is what happens when we run the simulation. Okay, here we go. Sure enough, something like that happens. I'm going to hit pause before these bounce off of the bumpers because I'm not interested in the bounce. I'm just interested in what happens afterwards. Now, going back here, you can see that, in fact, the diagram was correct, but it's not enough to just do diagrams. We have to know how to calculate the final angle of the originally moving ball and its original speed. So let's take a look at this. If you're on a pool table and you've got a bird's eye view, which is what we're dealing with here, then what forces would be acting? Well, for one thing, gravity would be straight down into the table. Of course, the normal force of the table would be straight up toward your eyes, and those two would cancel. The other forces in the uh, vertical, I guess you could call it, or maybe the y direction in the plane of the table, and the x direction, horizontal, or also just x in the plane of the table, are there any forces acting? Well, if there's no friction, and I think we're going to assume this here, if there's no friction, 
then are there any other forces acting? So no air resistance, no friction. You might say, well, the guy who is playing pool, who takes the pool cue and, you know, it's a terrible pool cue, but you get the idea, who hits the ball, he exerts a force on the ball. True. However, we're talking about after he has imparted that velocity to this ball. So I'm really not interested in this guy and his applied force. We can ignore that. I'm not interested in it. I'm interested in what happens afterwards. There is no other unbalanced force acting, and therefore that is the condition for delta P, the change in momentum of the system, to be zero. In other words, the law of conservation of momentum applies. So what is the thing to note about two-dimensional collisions versus one? Well, in one-dimensional collisions, we wrote the following. We were always in one dimension, so we could imagine that we were in the x direction. We used to write the following. P total equals P prime total. If there were two objects, we wrote P1 plus P2 equals P1 prime plus P2 prime. Oops. Well, guess what? Since that is just in one direction, we're just going to do this now. We're going to put an x and an x, x, x subscripts all over the place. So really, we're talking about in the x direction, this is what's happening. Momentum is conserved. We're also going to write in the y direction, p total y equals p prime total y, which is going to mean that p1 in the y direction plus p2 in the y direction equals p1 prime in the y direction plus p2 prime in the y direction. Now, a couple of things. Since we are denoting x as the direction down here, we technically don't need the vector hats here. So in future and in class, you're going to see me drop the vector hats when I'm talking about the x or the y direction. Let's see what else we can write here. First of all, object number two is not moving before the collision, so it has no momentum in x or y. So we can put in a zero there. Furthermore, we can write mv for momentum. So this will be m1 but v1x plus the zero that we had here. So I don't even need the plus actually. I can just write equals m2 v2, sorry, v1 prime in the x. Sorry, I'm making a lot of mistakes here. That should be a 1, m1 v1 prime in the x plus m2 v2 prime in the x. And now some other things. They said the masses were equal. They're all m's. So m1 is equal to m2. The masses here are going to cancel. And look what we get. v1x equals v1 prime x plus v2 prime x. Do we know any of these values? v1 in the x direction, well, it says that the uh, velocity well, actually, they don't tell you that the velocity is in the x direction. We are free to set our coordinate axes however we want. And so to make life easy, we often make the initial velocity move along one of the axes. So v1x will actually be just v1. That's worth noting. v1 prime in the x is... Now, let me see more mistakes that I've made. I see right now I've called this v2 prime. That should be a v1. I apologize. As you might guess, I'm trying to get through this as quickly as I can to post your video for you. Uh, yeah, the red one was number one, so there we go. Uh, V1 prime in the x direction, that's going to be a cos theta component. So let's just write that in. V1 prime in the x direction is equal to V1 prime cosine of theta. This is using your component ideas that you've already learned. V1 prime in the y direction will be oops, that's not a very good equal sign, there we go, will be v1 prime sine theta. So that we're basically saying this ball is moving somewhat upwards, but it's also moving somewhat horizontally. And in the same way, the blue one is moving somewhat horizontally, we'll call that v2 prime cosine 40 degrees. They gave us the angle for that. And this will be v2 prime sine 40 degrees. 
So where am I going with all this? Well, let's go back down to these equations and see. V1x, as I mentioned, is just V1, purely moving in the x direction, no need for sine or cos theta, is equal to V1 prime in the x direction, which we said was V1 prime cos theta, but we know V1, it's 1.36, so I can write 1.36 cos theta, plus V2 prime in the x, which, by the way, we know it's 1.1, so plus 1.1 cos 40 degrees. Now, let me just highlight this so that you can keep your eye on it. Look what you've got here. You have an equation that I'm going to call equation number one. Oops. I'm going to call this equation number one here. And it's telling you that some variable equals a number times another variable, theta's in there, plus a number and a number. Really, there are two variables in here. Those two variables, of course, are the ones we're looking for, v1 and theta. Unfortunately, you can't solve for two variables if you only have one equation. This is where the y components come in. So what are we going to do here? Let's look at what's going on in the y direction. Uh, oh, more happy news. Originally, this ball, ball number one, was moving purely in the x direction. We set that up by choosing which way our x and y axes would be oriented. So even p1 in the y direction is zero. So what do we end up with here? Zero equals p1 prime in the y direction. I see I forgot a letter y down there. So that will be m1 v1 prime in the y direction, and p2 prime in the y is m2 v2 prime in the y. However, once again, let's look at what happens. The masses are the same, so they are a common factor. They drop out in this example, and that leaves me with the following. v1 prime in the y direction, which is v1 prime sine theta, 0 equals v1 prime sine of theta, plus, this one's going to be, what did we write, v2 prime sine of 40 degrees, but keep in mind, we know v1 prime, it is 1.36, and we know v2 prime, it is 1.1. So I actually have a lot of information here. 0 equals 1.36 sine theta plus 1.1 sine 40 degrees. And if I highlight that so that you can keep your eyes on it, look what you've got. You've got two equations in two unknowns. I'll we'll call this equation two here. Unknowns are theta. Oh, hey, guess what? Even more happy news. There's only one unknown here. So using two, you can solve for theta. And then you're going to sub that theta in right here and you're going to solve for v1. And that's how you do these. It's really not one question with two dimensions. You could think of it as two little questions, each of them in one dimension. Your choice of how you want to look at it. But this is the way you do it. You derive one equation for the x direction, one for the y. You use them in algebra. You, com you combine them algebraically to solve. All right, and the textbook gives answers here, so I'm going to stop at this point. You should look in your textbook to see that you can get the right answers. I think, if I remember correctly, V1 comes out to about 2 meters per second, and if I remember correctly, the theta value is something like 30 or 31 degrees. This is for you to finish off on your own. All right, moving on. Let's talk about a, an unfortunate but very real application of two-dimensional collisions, and that is car accidents at an intersection. I went looking on YouTube and I found a video compilation of uh, crashes at a particular intersection somewhere in the United States. This is probably um, one of the traffic cameras that you see in cities all over the place. And uh, I got to warn you, if you go and watch this compilation series, most of the collisions don't look too harmful, but there is one where there's a motorcyclist who gets hit quite hard by a car. It's hard for me to tell which of the two was running the red light, 
However, uh, I don't know what his fate is. He did not look like he was in very good shape. He looked unconscious uh, after the collision. I'm not going to show that to you right now. It's up to you. You've been given fair warning, viewer discretion advised. But let's go take a look at this video, just this portion where these two trucks collide. So watch this. Here it is. This is the uh, link that you want to go to. And to skip the motorcycle accident, which is kind of graphic, you want to go to 39 seconds and press play. So watch what happens. Here come the two trucks and boom. They kind of both go off in the same direction. Not a very serious collision. A little bit of damage there. But notice how they kind of go off together. It's, a, it's possible that their bumpers became hitched or the two trucks kind of became joined which would be what we call a completely inelastic collision. But going back here, look what we have. We have the original velocity of car number one the original velocity of car number two. So we might name these, uh, let's call them, this is M1 traveling at V1, and here is M2 traveling at V2. Afterwards, if they join up, we have M1 plus M2, a combined mass, and if they've joined, they're going in the same direction, so I'm just going to call it V prime without the one or the two. Here's how I draw it in a diagram. Since we know at an intersection the uh, velocity vectors will meet at right angles, this looks like a right angle intersection, therefore I'm going to make one of the cars go on the x-axis, one moving along the y-axis. That's my choice and it makes calculations easier because I have no angles to deal with before the collision. After the collision the two go off on some angle, the common velocity, and a joined or combined mass. And the same rules apply you're going to write that p total in the x is equal to p prime total in the x and you'll create one equation. Obviously in the x direction initially only this mass has momentum this one has none. You're going to use a cosine theta for this after the collision. We do the same in the y And the beauty of setting up our axes like this is now M2 is purely moving in the Y direction. It's got all the momentum. This one has no momentum in the Y, just zero. After the collision, there will be an M combined of V prime. And you're going to want this component, so that will be a sine of theta in terms of your velocities. Two equations, two unknowns. There are questions like this in the textbook and many more for you to practice. You can find them online. That's it, folks. Quick video today because you actually already know the two main ideas here, law of conservation of momentum and vector components. Thanks for watching. No fact of the video today. I will see you in class. Bye.